Hi there, Michael. Hi, Laura. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you? Good. Very good. Thank you very much. Right. Um, and welcome everyone to our webinar on FCC and ICED test regulatory approvals. It looks like we've already got some people joining as we speak, so I'll go ahead and introduce our speaker today, Michael Darby. Uh, Michael is the Technical Director for our Global Connected Technologies Division within Element. He's worked as a manufacturer, test engineer and certification body. Michael is currently the Vice Chair of the TCB Council Board of Directors and is responsible for many technical papers on the topic of radio approvals and integration of radio into other equipment. He provides education and training activities, including webinar and seminar workshops. Before I hand you over to Michael, I just wanted to encourage everyone to submit any details you have, any questions you have, on the GoToWebinar panel to the right-hand side of your screen. And if you do lose connection for any reason, please refresh your browser or re-enter the GoToWebinar platform. Thank you, everyone. And with that, I'll now hand you over to Michael. Thank you very much, Laura. I will now share my uh, screen and I'll see you at the question and answer session. See Thank you. There. OK, thank you very much, Laura, and hello, everybody, and welcome to the FCC and ICED Canada Test and Regulatory Approvals webinar. So, as Laura said, my name is Michael Darby. I'm our technical director here in our Connected Technologies Department at Element Materials. We have labs all around the world, and I'm involved specifically in our Connected Technologies group, which is basically radio products or radio testing of products. As for me personally, um, well, I'm involved in a whole range of things involving test and regulatory approvals. Here at Element, we provide consultancy, product development, EMC testing, RF exposure, such as SAR, radio and wireless testing, product safety, global market access, and that includes the regulatory approvals, which I am involved in. For me personally, I started my career working for an equipment manufacturer doing EMC testing and EMC fixing of uh, failures. That started in the late 1980s and into the 1990s. From there, I was an EMC and radio test engineer in the UK and then in Silicon Valley in California. And I spent the last 13 or 14 years as a certification body. And most appropriate for this presentation, uh, I am a TCB uh, for the FCC and an FCB for ICED Canada. I spend quite a lot of my time teaching and providing seminars these days and solving people's compliance issues. So how does my personal journey fit into that of a element and your um, journey as you are probably a manufacturer? So probably as a manufacturer, when you think of a test lab, you think of the sort of development and design and uh, approvals part of your journey. Uh, and uh, but the whole journey for you is thinking about the, the concept of your product. So before you even start developing your product, you need to stop and think, is it feasible? Is it legal? Can I even sell it? Um, and that's a regulatory issue that uh, a lot of people don't think about until too late, where they develop and manufacture a product based on a great idea. Uh, and then only then at the last stage come along to somebody like myself um, and uh, realise that not everything can be manufactured and sold course anything could be manufactured uh, big could only be sold if it's uh, legally allowed to be done so. Um, also through the manufacturing and the sale of your product but also maintaining compliance after you've started selling your products and we'll go over that today. So for me personally as I say I started in the EMC and radio testing and certification world and RF exposure and test planning and then testing when products change. From there, I moved into the certification world and doing regulatory research, compliance planning and product certification and global market access to a range of different countries. And then as part of that, it includes this audit surveillance and tracking of changes to a manufacturer's products. If you start adding in then all the things that we do here at Element, you can see um, how my role has grown uh, to cover all the types of things that you as manufacturers need to think about right from the very first um, idea of your product to long after you've started selling it. 
OK, so why is this even useful for you? So we're going to talk about the regulatory approvals for North America. So that's the USA and Canada. And I'll do that by focusing mainly on the USA as that's the primary market. But I will also touch on the differences between the USA and Canada. I'm going to go over the testing requirements, not in great deal of detail. We've only got an hour here, um, but uh, some of the most important things that people often get wrong. And then the authorization requirements, often referred to as certification. Uh, but as you'll see in today's presentation, certification isn't the only authorization route available to you. So a lot of people would ask the question, well, I want to, uh, what do I want to do? Nobody really wakes up in the morning and says, do you know what? I'd really like to buy an EMC test today. Um, the sun's shining, uh, the weather's nice, maybe I'll pop out and uh, buy myself an EMC test. It is possible that you might know you've got an EMC problem and you might need to get it fixed, but actually, in the most part, you just want to be able to sell your product. So you're not saying, I want to get a test done. You're saying, I want to get my product to market as quickly as possible. And the same from a, a radio point of view. Uh, few people wake up and say to themselves, I wonder how long my Bluetooth frequency hopping radio spends on each channel. Um, maybe to some people that's very useful information. For me as a test engineer, it's something I uh, care deeply about. But to you, probably you just want to get your product to market as quickly as possible. Uh, in my experience, a lot of these tests are just a hurdle for you to get through uh, on the route to getting your product to market. And in fact, if these tests didn't exist magically, um, you wouldn't lose much sleep over that. You would still be looking to just get your product to market. And that's OK. And that's why we're here to help with that. Uh, why is getting your product to market quickly uh, such an important thing? Well, this is a very simple little graph put together. Not going to get me an MBA, this graph, but hopefully uh, you'll see the importance. I find a lot of people waste time on the compliance and the regulatory compliance stages. They'll, they'll often spend two or three weeks arguing over a test which takes one hour to perform. Um, uh, and why is that a problem? Well, let, let's imagine then you've got a product and you come up with an idea and you start spending money. So the cash is going and going and going until you launch your product. And then at the point you launch your product, you start making some money. The money starts coming in and hopefully at some point uh, the money that's coming in overtakes your original starting point and then anything after that is profit. Now at some point your product will go end of life and it's quite likely that you don't get to choose when that is. Uh, it might be the case that you come out with a subsequent model um, and so effectively you've chosen the end of life of your product, but it could be that one of your competitors comes out with a better product or that could be the state of the art moves on. People don't want your type of product anymore. Uh, or maybe you were making your product for a specific event, um, the Olympics or Christmas or something like that. And that moment comes and uh, um, and the time comes for the end of the sale of your product. You don't always get to pick when that is. So if you have delays and, and problems in the uh, development of your product, then you'll keep spending that cash uh, and your product launch date will slip. And then when you launch your product, obviously you'll start making money, um, but then your end of life date or uh, your date at which your product stops uh, going onto the market probably isn't going to change. So you can see then that uh, getting your product to market early um, is, is the best way to increase your profits long term. Um, I've even put the spend rate a bit steeper here uh, to really show that if you want to get your product to market quicker, then you might want to spend uh, more quickly. Uh, for example, just getting every test done correctly, getting every product certified correctly, um, and then getting that product to market as quickly as possible. Now, the imagined road to compliance. People often think about testing and approvals as being one topic. They say, I want to get my product tested so that it's approved for the market, or I want to 
get approval so that I know it passes the test. Well, the two topics are linked, but they're not the exact same thing. Testing is one thing and approvals is something different. You can test and it will give you really good, useful information. But if you do not do the testing exactly the way the regulations tell you to, then your approvals would become invalid. Similarly, you could have a product which appears to be fully approved based on the FCC ID or the CE mark on the product, um, but based on the way you configure it or you use it, the test results might not be appropriate. So it's important to get the correct testing and the correct approvals done. And uh, that's something I want to talk about today. OK, so why are we having this seminar? Really, my seminars or my webinars are always based on frequently made mistakes. I've been doing this for well over 30 years now, uh, and I see the same or similar mistakes made time and time again. People need to understand the requirements quite clearly, that the basic concepts are often wrong by a lot of people. Um, people make similar mistakes. Um, they don't think about the time to market. Maybe, as I mentioned before, trying to save a um, half an hour or a few hundred pounds or dollars on a test. Uh, which ends up delaying the project by a month because the certification body isn't able to complete the certification, for example. Um, and of course, increasing product quality. Um, the EMC and radio regulations, we often think of these as a, a regulatory hurdle, but a lot of manufacturers use them to demonstrate or to prove to themselves that their product is working correctly and reduce the risks on the market. Even once a product is sold, market surveillance, of course, has the uh, possibility to remove your product from the market if it has not been authorised correctly. OK, so the agenda and goals, we're going to talk about uh, compliance requirements in general and the difference between testing and authorisation. We're going to go through some of the testing requirements and the authorisation requirements. Um, and then maintaining compliance when you make changes to the products or if the regulations change. Timing. I, I'm more talking quite quickly. I appreciate that. I apologise for that. This would typically be at least a one day seminar for me, this topic. Um, if you're interested in that, please get in touch. But for now, we're going to try and squeeze as much information as we can into a uh, one hour webinar. I will try and allow time for questions and answers at the end. If the webinar takes approximately one hour, I will stay and answer questions for as long as that takes. OK, so let's get straight in then with the USA. And the USA has the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, and that's their new logo quite recently uh, released. So when would the FCC rules and regulations apply to your product if you're a manufacturer? Well, uh, firstly, if you have a radio product or any kind of electronic device, then it's going to be covered uh, by the FCC if it's for sort of commercial, domestic, industrial use. A little bit like the EMC directive and the radio equipment directive squashed together, uh, the FCC rules cover radio equipment and uh, non-radio or electronic devices. So transmitters, receivers, and digital devices are covered by the FCC rules. Our main focus today is going to be on radio equipment. As I say, it covers commercial and non-military equipment because military, specifically only military equipment, are not within the scope of the FCC's requirements. So there are two authorization routes available for you if you have your product that you wish to sell into the USA. There's SDOC, no self declaration of conformity, and that covers mostly the electronics and most types of radio receivers. If the SDOC applies to your product, a certification is optional, so you could always choose certification if you wish for the FCC, or if SDOC is available to you, if it's just an electronic device or a receiver, then you could choose that one. The other authorization route is certification and most radio transmitters require certification. There are a few uh, transmitters which can be authorised through SDOC, but most of the common ones are certification. 
There are also some devices which are within the scope of the FCC rules, but exempt from FCC authorization. Some types of digital devices are exempt from authorization and receivers below 30 megahertz or above 960 megahertz are exempt from authorization. So, for example, people often say to me, I've heard that GPS receivers are exempt from FCC authorization, but I can't find anything in the FCC rules which mention GPS receivers. Well, that's because that's an industry term, and this is the reason why a GPS at 1.6 gigahertz would be exempt from authorization. Some of the digital devices which would be exempt, well, of course, military equipment, because that's not covered by the FCC. Unintentional radiators, that's an FCC term for something that isn't a transmitter, for where the uh, digital device part is for use in a vehicle or in transport, for test equipment, household or, or industrial appliances, medical uh, ISM equipment and, um, uh, sorry, medical equipment, um, or low power consumption equipment. So you can look in FCC 15.103 uh, to find out the full list of exempt from authorization devices. And for Canada, it's ICED's uh, standard ICES and then the 00, 00 clause, for example, 001 or 2 or 3. And now it's very important to note that this exemption from authorization is for the digital device part. So let's say, for example, you've got um, an appliance like a washing machine. It's saying that the digital device part of that is exempt from authorization. If you've got a Bluetooth washing machine, the digital device part would be exempt from authorization, but the Bluetooth transmitter within it would require certification because multiple authorizations can apply to one product for the USA. Now, hopefully that will become a lot more clear as we go through this presentation. So what testing is covered within the scope of the FCC's assessment? So RF safety or RF exposure, EMC performance emissions and radio performance on the transmitter. So RF exposure such as SAR or the uh, full body irradiation known as MPE is covered by the FCC. Product safety is not. EMC emissions are covered by the FCC. EMC immunity is not. And radio transmitter performance is covered. Radio receiver performance is not, uh, with the possible exception of things like DFS or contention based protocols for some types of radio. OK, so let's look at some of these terminologies then. Unintentional radiator. That's a strange expression to use, and it kind of suggests that something can magically transmit even if it's not meant to. What it really means is electronic device where if you were to take it, put it into an anechoic chamber at a test lab and make a measurement, you would see something come off of it, but it's not really what it's meant to do. Uh, the screen or the laptop I have in front of me, for example, if you did an emissions test on that, you would see some emissions from it, but it's not a transmitter. So these are known as unintentional radiators. This is general electronics or radio receivers. Uh, these things are all covered by FCC Part 15, Subpart B. Part 15 is kind of a, uh, a multi-part section of the FCC rules. Subpart A has some general requirements. Subpart B is for unintentional radiators. And Subpart C and onwards are for all different types of transmitter or intentional radiators. And for Canada, they have these standards known as interference causing equipment standards. The other term used with the FCC in Canada is intentional radiator. Well, as you can imagine, this is basically a transmitter. Uh, and they are loosely split into two types of category. You have unlicensed transmitters, uh, and that's the type of transmitter that you could just walk around and transmit anywhere you like. Uh, such as Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, RFID or a key fob or a doorbell, or a licensed transmitter where either you'd need a specific license to be allowed to use it, such as 
a theatre or radio microphone um, or a cell phone or a base station. Now, you may think you can walk around and use your mobile phone anywhere you like, um, but uh, you only have to look to see how it would come up and say no service um, if uh, it doesn't want you to transmit. Basically, the, the licensed base station tells your phone what frequency to transmit on and what power to do with that. So let's start with the choosing the authorization route for these receivers, IT equipment and digital devices, which, as we've just learned, are known as unintentional radiators. These could be either SDOC or certification. For the FCC, most people choose SDOC, and the SDOC route is, as you'll see here, uh, the easiest route. For Canada, SDOC is mandatory. Uh, you cannot choose certification for that type of equipment. Um, there are some uh, uh, rules which uh, list exactly the type of device. So FCC 15.101, for example, lists all types of uh, unintentional radiator uh, and shows you which authorizations are available. So here's a quick screen grab of the table at the beginning of 15.101. You can see all different types of receiver and digital devices there. So typically part 15 receivers are either SDOC or certification. You can see digital devices, computer peripherals, they're all SDOC or certification. That means that you as the manufacturer can choose which authorization route you want to take. Transmitters then, or intentional radiators, most of these are certification. So when we're talking about Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, RFID, remote controls, all the cellular stuff, GSM, UMTS, LTE, 4G, 5G, these are all certification. One of the few example, uh, exemptions to that would be like a microwave fixed link is in part 101 of the FCC rules and those can have SDOC. So let's look at the SDOC authorization procedure. Test to the correct standards. So the FCC rules say that to be correctly authorized, you must test and you must test to the correct standard. If you do not test or if you do not correct test to the correct standard, or if you deviate from the standard, your authorization is invalid because you haven't followed the procedure correctly. The man uh, manufacturer then maintains documents and compliance. There's no such thing as kind of a notified body equivalent where you can say, I want to use DOC, um, I've deviated from the standard, but I want to prove that I've done the right thing. Uh, you simply follow the SDOC procedure, test correctly to the correct standard, and that means that your DOC is valid. So perform the required tests, compile and keep the technical data such as the test reports, and label with FCC statements. So there's no FCC, um, FCC ID or registration number associated with SDOC, but there are compliance statements that must appear in the user manual uh, which is the manufacturer's way of confirming um, that they have followed the SDOC procedure. There is a logo available, but it's optional. So with the SDOC, it's a procedure, a process. It's not a document. You don't have to create an SDOC document. The SDOC refers to the process or procedure you must follow. And if you follow that procedure correctly, um, then that is the authorization route and your product is correctly authorized at the end of it. You don't have to create a document. It's all based on user manual statements um, and the name and address of a USA based company must appear in your user manual if you're following the SDOC route. And this is probably the main reason why a lot of people would choose certification instead of SDOC if they don't have a USA based contact that they can reference. And I mentioned that there's a logo, so you may have seen this symbol. If you want to use this symbol, which is optional, then it specifically means that you have followed the SDOC procedure. If you haven't used SDOC for your product, you must not put that logo on your product. Well, let's have a look at certification now then. 
Test again the correct way to the correct standards. That's very important. Maintain documents and compliance and the additional step of a review by a TCB or certification body and registration of your equipment with the FCC. So perform the required tests, compile all your technical document known as exhibits, um, which is proof, I guess, that uh, lawyers are involved in the writing of it. Uh, submit all the information to the certification body or the TCB and then receive the FCC grant of authorization and the ICED Canada certificate. Uh, there is an additional step with Canada um, where the product has to get listed on their radio equipment list, but I will come to that. So with certification, there is an FCC ID, and this is a little number that appears on the product. It's a legal traceable reference number to the certification of your product. It's made up of two parts. There's the grantee code, where the grantee is the manufacturer or the company getting the product certified, and then the product code, which is specific to that product model. For Canada, um, that also has a, a certification number. It's preceded just by the letters IC. Um, again, it's a traceable reference number, and the, uh, the first half of that is your company's number, and the second half is specific to the product. Both of these numbers, uh, they don't just mean, yes, my product passed. They refer to your online certification file. Um, and, um, and so if you make any changes to the product, it's important to say, well, it's not just a case of does my product pass or fail, it's making sure my certification file is up to date. Model numbers. Uh, the FCC doesn't care about model numbers. Uh, you may or may not have a model number on your product for the FCC, and you may change your model number without telling the FCC or the or the certification body. For Canada, however, it is different. There's a, a model number which must appear on the product, and that's known as the HVIN or hardware version identification number. There's also a product marketing name, which may be the same as the HVIN model number, or it might be a completely different name. You might market your product under a cool, exciting sounding name, and then you might have a, a slightly more boring sounding um, model number actually listed on it. And Canada wants to know exactly what those numbers are. And if you change them, you have to update your certification files. So I've mentioned a TCB a few times, and I am indeed a TCB, but what exactly is a TCB? Telecommunications Certification Body. All FCC certifications are performed by a TCB. You cannot go directly to the FCC and ask them to do the certification for you anymore. We're industry bodies designated by the FC FCC. We have specific and clear rules and responsibilities. Um, for example, we're allowed to review your product, review your documents, review your test reports and complete the certification. We, almost, uh, we also must perform market surveillance testing, um, uh, but we must also follow the published rules. So, for example, you cannot say, well, OK, I deviated from the standard, but I'll go and ask my TCB if they can accept it. The TCB is not allowed to accept that. We have to follow testing. Uh, we have to accept testing that has been correctly done to the correct standard. Part of our job is to confirm that it was all tested correctly. Um, the application to the TCB must identify the radio equipment. So for example, the user manual or instructions, external photos, internal photos, your label showing the FCC ID and IC number um, and the label location. Some of those things may be kept confidential under certain difficult circumstances, uh, but for the most part, all of these documents are going to be in public view. Technical uh, details of the product, so the operation description, schematics, parts lists, block diagram. A document called a tune-up procedure. Really, this is the manufacturer's way of confirming how they make sure the output power is consistent of their radio um, and stating what the rated power and their tolerance is. These documents can be held confidential. 
So you have to give them to the TCB, but when we upload them to the FCC, uh, we can make them so that they can't be viewed by general public. The test results and reports, of course, everyone always assumes that the test reports are the most important or only important document. They're certainly important, but they're not the only important document. So transmitter test reports, EMC emissions test reports, RF exposure assessments, um, and test setup photographs. None of these can be held confidential, so they will all be in the public domain. There is a minimum quality uh, of documents and details that you must provide. So often people will say to me, well, what's the minimum level of detail I can provide which will guarantee me certification? Well, the answer is uh, in two parts, really. What will guarantee me certification? Well, perfectly follow exactly what the FCC rules say and what the TCB asks for. What's the minimum you can provide? Well, you could cut a few corners, but you're probably going to delay your time to market because the TCB might have questions. And any time you cut corners too much, you expose your certification to the to the risk that it might get dismissed or rejected by the FCC or by Canada. Often people will say, well, another TCB accepts it before or, you know, this other TCB doesn't ask for it. But honestly, those TCBs are not really doing you any favours because it, the rules are very, very clear about how your product should be. If a TCB is accepting things that are substandard, then it might seem like they're doing you a favour, but really it just means that your certification may not be 100% correct. As a manufacturer, to get your product robustly certified correctly, it's in your interest to get all your documentation correct. Now, I mentioned before that multiple authorizations may apply to one product when I talked about the washing machine with the Bluetooth, for example. Um, and that's the case here with the FCC. So if you've got a product that has multiple modes or functions, um, then multiple authorizations will apply to it. So, for example, if you've got multiple types of transmitter, then multiple transmitter certifications will exist. They will all have the same FCC ID, but they'll have different equipment classes. So I have a mobile phone here. It's got 5G, 4G, 3G, 2G, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, RFID. These are all different types of transmitter. They'll all be certified with one FCC ID, uh, but they, um, they'll all have their own FCC grants and their own equipment classes. So multiple equipment classes means that multiple FCC grants for one product. Also, an SDOC may apply. I could put this into airplane mode uh, and play games on it, take photographs, listen to music. Um, even if it's not in airplane mode, it, I'm not always using it as a transmitter. It's got radio receivers between 960 uh, megahertz and 30 megahertz. It's got LTE and uh, receivers in that band. Uh, and it's also just got digital devices. So uh, a cell phone is most likely going to have multiple certifications and an SDOC. My laptop in front of me, SDOC as a laptop and a certification as a Bluetooth and a certification as a Wi-Fi. OK, so let's have a little look at the overview here. Um, so if we look at all the different tests necessary, we can imagine EMC emissions from a device, EMC emissions from a transmitter, radio transmitter performance and RF exposure. These are all the types of tests I mentioned before are included in your FCC assessment. So if I've got a device with multiple uh, transmitters in it, like a basic phone might have cellular, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, then all of the emissions and the transmitter performance and the RF exposure of those transmitters must be assessed separately. And then they will each have their own certificate. They'll have the same FCC ID, but they'll each one have their own certification within the FCC. And the EMC emissions from the digital device will either have its own certification or it will have an SDOC. And they will all filter down to make that final product FCC authorised. 
If your product is also medical, then you may have to go to the FDA or Food and Drug Administration, um, and it might also need a, a medical authorization. But the FCC just deals with the EMC and radio part over there. But you can see that all of those multiple authorizations may be applying to one device. So if you've got a product like a cell phone, or if we were in a real classroom here, we might have an overhead projector, which might have electronics and it might have um, remote control, Bluetooth, for example, or you might have a vehicle. So let's say you've got the infotainment system in a vehicle that might have GPS and Bluetooth. Well, we've already decided that the digital electronics um, of, in a vehicle would be exempt from authorization. And we've already decided that the GPS would be too high in frequency to require authorization, but the Bluetooth transmitter would still require an authorization if it's inside a vehicle. So the authorization longevity. Um, once you get your product certified with the FCC, it's a one time thing. So you have your product tested, certified by the TCB, and then that's it. Uh, the term is grandfathering, which means that the product remains certified. Even if the rules change or the test standard changes, there's no need to go and update it. With the FCC, you have the rules, you have a book of rules. When I first started, it was literally a book. Now, of course, it's a website. Um, and you are testing to a standard to certify to the rules. So the certification is to the FCC rules. The testing is done to demonstrate compliance with the rules. The rules tell you that you must do that testing, but the testing is just so that you can certify to the rules. So if the test standard changes later on, your certification to the rules remains valid. There are some rare cases where the rules themselves change and then sometimes the manufacturer does have to update their certification, but that doesn't happen very often. So your compliance planning is very important. Firstly, before you even start soldering things together, uh, at the early developmental stage, you need to ask yourself, can I even sell my product in the USA or Canada? Do not assume that uh, it's remarkable how many times people come to me with a product, an idea that they've developed to really quite an advanced stage, only then to find out that they are unable to sell it in the USA or Canada. Can I sell it the way I want to? Well, again, just because you had an idea and you've seen that other people have a similar idea or you know it's possible, um, make sure that you can sell it in the way you want it to. You might have had an idea for a product where the user can decide which frequency that it transmits at or which power it transmits at, or the user can just randomly pick which antenna to use. You might end up with a product which looks possible, but actually you could not sell it in that exact way if it doesn't meet the rules. Do I need to test it? Yes, you absolutely do. For FCC compliance, you really do, because the rules say so. The rules say you must test, whether it's SDOC or certification, the rules say you must test and they tell you exactly how to test. What standards should I test to? Well, EMC, radio transmitters and RF exposure, you must only use the authorised standards or test methods. There's a group called ANSI, which writes standards, and the FCC published documents which are known as KDBs, and we'll talk about that in a moment. You have to perfectly follow those, um, otherwise your product is not correctly authorised. And in the case of certification, the TCB can only certify if you follow the correct standards. Uh, which lab is able to test it? Well, if it's um, SDOC, you need to choose a lab which is capable of doing the testing and has got the right test site, but an accreditation is not needed. For certification, you have to have a lab which is accredited, accredited to the right rule part and listed on the FCC's website. And I said Canada's website. Will I need a TCB? Yes, for the FCC, you absolutely need a TCB. Um, 
the TCB is not like a notified body. We cannot um, make judgments or, or accept deviations. We are checking that you did correctly test to the published standards. Um, labeling and documentation, so the FCC ID and the compliance statements. Um, FCC ID if you're using certification or compliance statements if it's SDOC. And compliance going forward, keep a sample for audit, or audit surveillance. Uh, I mentioned that the FCC, uh, no I didn't, I mentioned that the TCB uh, takes part in audit surveillance activities. We have to test 5% um, of the products that we certify every year. So a manufacturer must keep one by. Uh, if you ask the FCC about this, they'll say, well, if you plan to sell 10,000 units, then you should make 10,001 just in case. If you plan to sell one unit, well, you should make two just in case, because you could get called to send in a production sample for audit surveillance. If a product is going to get rebranded by another manufacturer, there is a way to change the certification without having to have a complete new test and new certification. So if a product is tested and certified by the manufacturer and then later a different manufacturer wants to rebrand it and put their name on the product, then it can be uh, the certification can be put into the name of a new company. With the FCC, this is known as a change in ID, where you've put a different FCC ID on that product. For Canada, it's called a multiple listing because the certification of a product with Canada is, is referred to as the listing of that product. So a multiple listing would be that product is listed multiple times under different manufacturers. Now, I mentioned uh, these documents known as a KDB, which stands for Knowledge Database. Um, here's a image of the FCC screen whereby um, they publish documents on how to do a particular type of test or certification. And, um, and you can search on technology types. It's not always easy to find them, and so you might need to contact your TCB to ask if you have any need for that. So uh, for anybody really, <coughs> excuse me, a manufacturer or a test lab and certainly a TCB, it's important to have a broad knowledge of the requirements, not just know one part of it. So, for example, you could sit and read the requirements in the FCC rules and you would really understand the rules, but at the end of it, you wouldn't know how to do the tests. Similarly, you could sit and read the test procedures and the test methods and you might really fully understand how to do the tests, but you wouldn't know what the limits are and you wouldn't know how to set the product up. It's really important to understand the requirements in the FCC rules and the requirements in the standards. My experience tells me that uh, a lot of manufacturers understand the FCC rules, but don't fully understand exactly how their product must be tested. And a lot of test labs focus so much on the test methods and standards that they forget that there's a specific uh, way that it must be assessed as per the rules. So um, as I said, testing for SDOC, the test lab accreditation or listing is not mandatory. Um, the test must be performed to the correct standard or the correct KDB. The test site requirements are in the standard. So we couldn't just do the testing downstairs in my kitchen here. You need a test site which conforms with the standards. The report must be signed and kept in the USA. So the local USA representative would need to keep a signed copy of the report. And that's signed by the manufacturer, by the way. Um, not, obviously, the report would be signed by the test lab, but the manufacturer needs to sign it. What most manufacturers do is sign like a front cover letter that they would pin to the report. Um, and again, this is the sort of thing where if the manufacturer is unable to do this, they may choose certification for their uh, unintentional radiator instead. Testing for certification, test lab accreditation and listing is mandatory. The test lab uh, must test to the correct standards the test site must be listed on the FCC and ICED Canada's websites 
and the report is reviewed by the certification body and uploaded to the FCC and ICED websites. And as I mentioned before, they'll also be publicly available on the FCC website. Um, the testing must be performed to the standard and the KDB at the time of certification, not at the time of testing. So, for example, if you are testing to a, an FCC's KDB or a Canadian standard, and then one or two years later you say, Do you know what, let's move ahead with that product now, we tested it already, uh, let's go and get it certified. It doesn't have to be years, it could be months. If the requirements in the procedure or the standard has changed, you may need to retest. Once your product is certified, if the test method is changed, that's OK. Your, your certification is complete. But your test methods and procedures must be correct at the time of certification. So if you test and then take too long and then certify and the requirements changed in the meantime, you're going to have to go back and retest. Um, you must use the specific listed test site. So you couldn't have a test company which is listed with the FCC or Canada, um, but does the measurement at a test site which is non-listed. That would not be OK. And real graphical test results must appear in the test reports, uh, emissions plots, things like that. Uh, this is very important. It's for a start, it's written in the rules. So the TCB should only accept the report if it's there. But secondly, market surveillance, the FCC or the TCB may need to perform the testing to check that they get the same results as the manufacturer and test lab did. And so it's very important for us to be able to see exactly how the test equipment was set up. So let's have a look at the testing for the FCC in Canada. Radiated emissions, we're looking at emissions from the transmitter and from the digital device conducted emissions from the AC power port, and that covers anything that could be connected by AC or DC. So if you have a DC powered device, you power it through a typical AC to DC power supply and then perform the emissions on that input to that power supply. And transmitter performance, for example, output power, duty cycle, um, frequency in the band, the, the mask, and of course, the spurious emissions. RF exposure is loosely split into two categories. You have uh, portable devices which are used within 20 centimetres of the body or typically held or worn on the body, or mobile, which is more than 20 centimetres from the body in normal use. Fixed equipment is also uh, a third category, um, but as you can imagine, it's also more than 20 centimetres from the person. Portable equipment are assessed to SAR, specific absorption rate, and this is the uh, power or energy put into body tissue. Um, SAR testing may not be necessary if the power of the transmitter is low enough, um, but if the power is above a certain threshold, then SAR testing is necessary. For mobile equipment, they have this term MPE or maximum permissible exposure. This can be handled through calculation or exemption, or in cases where the power is high enough, you may need to perform a test um, or a more detailed calculation. Every type of transmitter requires an RF exposure assessment. You must use the correct standard um, in the FCC rules um, or the KDB um, and in the ICED Canada standards. Uh, do not assume that the FCC and Canada align. They do not always align. Sometimes the formal ANSI standards get published and they get adopted by Canada before they get adopted by the FCC. Um, or sometimes the FCC might put out a test procedure that Canada doesn't accept. So always check that they do match. The FCC published these KDBs or knowledge database documents. Um, if you're looking for a hierarchy within the FCC, there's the FCC rules is the most important document. The KDBs um, are the next most important and then the standards are the final one. And as I said, not all of these are accepted by Canada. 
Um, if you really want to deviate from the standard or you want to do something different, that isn't impossible. You can do that. You would need to write specifically to the FCC and Canada and ask for permission, explain what you're planning to do. And then if they say yes, you would provide proof of that permission to the TCB with your test results. Then the TCB could accept the deviation because they've seen that the FCC in Canada would allow it. Um, here's a quick table here. This is quite useful and certainly will be useful for anyone who's going to tune into next week's uh, presentation about radio modules and their installation. So spurious emissions is a test. You want to ask what frequency must I test up to? This table here will tell you. So based on the highest frequency clock or processor within your product uh, for an unintentional radiator. And then this table for an intentional radiator. So you can see here, for example, if you had a 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, you'd be testing up to the 10th harmonic. If we go back to the last slide, um, if you had a product here, let's say it had a, um, a 200 megahertz clock in it, you would test up to two gigahertz. But if you also had a Bluetooth or Wi-Fi in that, where it had a 2.4 gigahertz device in your product, then you'd be testing your part 15B emissions up to the fifth harmonic, which is 12.5 gigahertz. So some common testing mistakes then, um, often picking the wrong detector types um, or wrong averaging techniques. People see in the FCC rules that it says measure it average and the engineer says, OK, great. Don't worry. I know what I'm doing. I'll find a great way to make an average measurement. Well, it's not all about you making a great measurement or you knowing a great way to make the measurement. It's about you making the exact type of average measurement that the FCC or Canada rules call for. It doesn't always make the most sense to us as engineers, but it must be followed or otherwise the authorization is not valid. You might have a really exciting new spectrum analyzer which has new features, but if those features have not yet been adopted by the FCC in Canada, then again, you should not use them or must not use them. EUT modes, um, one of the most common ones would be um, FMCW sweeping signals where, or sweeping transmitters where people try and test them while they're sweeping, whereas the rules say they must be stopped. Some of these rules are changing actually as test procedures get developed. Um, so depending on the frequency band, you need to look at that quite carefully. Output power settings. Uh, people using test software um, to set the radios to certain channels and then not realizing that the uh, power is set incorrectly. Um, also, things like Wi-Fi often use power reduction on the edge channels like channels 1 and 12 um, and then not realizing that those are therefore not the highest power uh, settings. So, for example, for a 2.4 gig Wi-Fi, um, you're typically asked to test three channels, but if you have power reduction on the end ones, you might end up testing channels 1, 2, 3, 6, 10, 11 and 12. And test reduction. Um, people often thinking that well, just proving that my product passes is the only issue. So if I do some quick sweep to check um, which is my worst case mode and then just testing that one. Uh, well, if that's not what the standard asks for, if the standards ask you to test every mode, then you must test every mode. And of course, the, the common mistake is a bunch of people sitting around in a conference room trying to guess what would be the worst case mode or a worst case model if you've got 10 variants, for example. Uh, I think any of us, if we had the ability to guess um, EMC and emissions results without making measurements, well, we wouldn't need to be sitting here listening to this webinar. Antenna requirements. Now, transmitters for North America are certified with their antenna. For the FCC, if it's a part 15 unlicensed transmitter, they must be tested and certified with the antenna. For licensed transmitters, uh, you only need to calculate the antenna in, in most cases. So, but for part 15 transmitters, all radiated test cases must be done with the antenna connected. And you must, if you 
likely to provide multiple antennas, you have to test with the highest gain version of each antenna type. Antenna type is not a defined term and it's based on radiation pattern. So if you have five different antennas and they are all called uh, monopole or they're all called, uh, you know, I don't know, dipole even, um, but they actually have different radiation patterns, uh, then they're different types. Um, additional requirements exist for some types of radio. So, for example, 5 gigahertz wireless LAN or 6 gigahertz wireless LAN um, DFS or contention based protocols. These are kind of a receiver test, and so you have to also test the lowest gain antenna there. So, let's have a look at some of the comparisons then. For the FCC, Part 15 transmitters are tested and certified with their antennas. Licensed transmitters are certified often without the antenna, um, except for radio modules, which must follow the Part 15 antenna rules. For Canada, all transmitters are certified with the antenna, uh, and antennas are listed in the user instructions or in the user manual for all transmitters. If you have multiple radios in one device, as I mentioned earlier, um, that you're going to have multiple uh, authorizations. So transmitters, receivers, transceivers. The FCC rules do state that if you have multiple transmitters in a device, they must all be on during the testing. Obviously, that's if they can all be on in real life. You, you shouldn't use software to force your radio into a, um, an unnatural mode just to test it in that way. Um, but in general, the FCC and Canada are looking at a much more holistic compliance solution. So in the past, people kind of said, well, I've done the test. Um, I, I think I'm OK. Or I've tested this transmitter, it passes. And I've tested that transmitter, it passes. And, and not really paying too much attention to having them both switched on. Or as you'll learn next week, if you tune into next week's webinar, if you incorporate a radio module into a host product is essential that you reassessing the final product for radio performance and performing radio testing on the final product because the final company is responsible for the whole compliance of that product. Market surveillance. The FCC and I said so FCC audits products. They look at their own website randomly, uh, although typically based on risk factors, um, new or complicated types of technology, new or inexperienced test labs or TCBs, or manufacturers or TCBs or test labs who have only, uh, a reputation or experience of making mistakes. Uh, I said Canada reviews every certification and they are creating a risk factor based on the mistakes that they see in certifications. And they're assigning a risk factor to all of the companies involved in the certification, such as the TCB and the test lab and the manufacturer. And they're sharing that information with the FCC. The TCBs uh, and Canadian CBs call in and test 5% of the products that we certify each year. And uh, really, though, one of the biggest parts of market surveillance is the competitor. Uh, the, um, all of the documents are in the public domain, test reports, for example, and people are quick to complain. So if you try to deviate from your testing or cut some corners with your testing and you've tried to convince your lab um, to do the wrong test or the lab has decided to do the wrong test and somehow you've convinced the TCB to accept it, um, those things are all going to be public and everybody will be looking at that. Um, at best, um, your competitors will say, I want to do that too. Um, but at worst and most likely, they'll sort of report you to the FCC. Now, maintaining compliance. Firstly, as a manufacturer, once your product is tested and certified, you need to ensure you're always selling an authorised device. So keep on top of your manufacturing quality to make sure you're always selling a correct device. The TCBs must call in and test 5% of the products and the TCB must report the results of that finding to the FCC and Industry Canada, by the way. 
manufacturers must be aware of this requirement. The FCC and Canada have both expressed concern that a lot of manufacturers have been getting products certified and really unaware that they have to keep products available for market surveillance in case they're asked. It's very important for TCBs to educate their customers in this way. Tracking changes. So if a manufacturer wants to make changes to their product, then this is known as a permissive change if the product is certified. So what exactly does that mean? Well, if a product is already certified and you want to completely change it to a new product, then you'd get a new certification. But if you want to keep the existing certification you've got, but make a modification to that product anyway, without changing your certification FCC ID, then there are types of changes which are permitted, and this is known as a permissive change. Um, there's no such thing as a permissive change for SDOC devices. So for SDOC, um, if you change a product, you're going to need to reassess it and check that your SDOC procedure has been maintained fully for that product. Basically, you're going to need to make sure you've got test results for it. And obviously, all the documentation has to be available in case anyone asks for it. So if we're making a change to a product, um, if it's SDOC, we're basically testing for to check that our changes haven't caused a non-compliance and keeping our results on record. For certification, however, the product data is already stored online. So the details of your product are held by the FCC and Canada already. And so if you change that product, product then it might lead to this permissive change. So permissive changes, they could be changes to the antenna or the software or the enclosure or the non-transmitter components. If you make changes to those things and the changes are not too extreme, then it could be possible to do a permissive change. And that's a change to your certification. The different levels or different classes of permissive change. If you've done some changes to your product and your emissions checks and your tests have proved that um, the emissions are unchanged or they're better than before, then it's a class one permissive change. You do not need to tell the TCB or the FCC. However, if your emissions or your test results have got worse or your emissions are higher or new signals have appeared, then you do need to inform the FCC in Canada, and that's known as a class two permissive change. Other classes do exist. So for example, for ICID Canada, if you change the software, it's a class three permissive change. And if you change um, the installation of a radio module into a host, it's class four permissive change. Um, one thing I want to note about permissive changes, by the way, uh, people often say to me, if I make this change to my product, will it be a class two or a class one permissive change? But that's not how it works. You don't guess the class before you do the testing. You make the change to the product, you do the tests to check your product still passes, then you look at your results and then your results tell you if it's a class one or class two. There are some types of change that have to be class two, um, but if the um, but for a lot of the changes, if the results are lower or better than before, then it can be a class one. Okay, more on permissive changes. So, um, if the transmitter part, so the transmitter part is what's certified, and if the transmitter part changes, it needs a new certification. Because remember, certification isn't just about pass or fail. It's about registering the transmitter with the FCC and ICED Canada. Even if the power is the same, the frequency is the same, even if the performance looks just the same and it passes by just the same amount, if you've changed the transmitter, it needs a new certification, a new listing. Even if you say, well, it, it still passes, uh, you know, it, it looks the same, um, it's a different listing, it's a different certification. As I said on a previous slide there, it's not always possible to answer, is it class one or class two permissive change? There are some changes. So for example, with the FCC, if you I don't know, change the color of a plastic product and the, the paint or the content of the plastic isn't conductive, 
you might just say to yourself, this is a class one permissive change, I'm not even going to test it. But for the most part, you've got to test. If you make some hardware change, let's say you change connectors, or you change a screen type, or you move some components um, that are not transmitter components, you're going to have to do an emissions check to figure out what you've done, and that will tell you if it's a class one or class two permissive change. There are some changes which are just definitely class two. So, for example, if you've added a, a new antenna type um, or a higher antenna gain, or you've um, used software to add an additional frequency band or frequency range, that's definitely going to be a class two permissive change. OK, so let's move now to Canada. So it used to be called Industry Canada, now they're ICED Canada, Innovation, Science and Economic Development Canada. Everything's in English and French for Canada. So again, let's look just at some comparisons. So for the FCC, you'd have an FCC ID which would appear on a certified product. The FCC rules cover all the operations of the product and the radio and the non-radio parts of the device are covered in the FCC rules. All of the certification is performed by a TCB, and that's an immediate function. So as a TCB, I complete the review, I upload the information to the FCC website. When I'm sitting in my office and I click accept to state that I have finished my certification, the product is certified at that point, and I send the FCC grant to the manufacturer, and it's certified from then on. Compare that to ICED, so you have a certification number, there's a mandatory hyphen in the middle of it for Canada. It's an optional, uh, optionally you can have a hyphen in your FCC ID if you wish. For Canada, you're certifying to the radio standards. So you're not certifying to the rules by testing to a standard, you're actually certifying to a standard. And that's why if the standards get incremented, um, you would have to change the standard that you're certifying to. For the non-transmitter parts, those standards are called ICES, and for the radio transmitters, they're called RSS. And those cover the radio and the non-radio uh, parts, just as before. The big difference in the certification stage is that the certification body, and by the way, for Canada, you could choose to get your certification done by ICED Canada directly, if you wish, but most people use the certification body. As a certification body, we complete our review, we send our certificate to the manufacturer. Then we submit the application to Canada. They audit the application, and if they're happy with it, they list it on their website. That won't happen on the same day. The product is only actually certified when Canada lists it on their website. And that's why the real certification date on the Canadian website doesn't match the certificate you receive from the certification body. Uh, for the FCC, there's certification for transmitters and SDOC or certification for the other things such as receivers and digital devices, and there are some exempt digital devices. For ICED, the certification for transmitters is the same. SDOC must be done for, uh, that should be self-certification, uh, should be done for the, um, uh, the electronics and the receiver. There is also an exempt devices, exempt digital devices list, but be careful, they are slightly different to the FCC. For example, um, electronics in vehicles for the FCC only refers to, um, sorry, for the FCC refers to any electronics intended for use in a vehicle. For Canada, it only applies to electronics which are installed by the manufacturer before the re uh, vehicle is placed on the market, not aftermarket products. For the FCC, there's an FCC ID, a compliance statement, and the S optional SDOC logo, and everything must be in English. For Canada, there is the certification number, the compliance statements, the model number, the product marketing name, the firmware identification number, if there is one, and all the compliance statements must be in English and French. So the listing timeline for Canada, the TCB or the FCB, Foreign Certification Body, um, reviews and issues a certificate, um, and then we submit the product to Canada. Canada then reviews the application and lists it on their website. 
Canada reviews every application that comes from the certification bodies. If they see big mistakes, they'll pass it back to the certification body and ask for it to be fixed. If they see small mistakes, problems with the test uh, report or the manufacturer's documentation, they'll note all those down um, and create a kind of risk factor for every company involved. And that will trigger them to look more closely at the documentation from those companies in the future which of course slows down your certification, and they share their information with the FCC and the EU Commission. Now, one big difference between Canada and the USA is the longevity. So with the EU, everybody is pretty comfortable with the fact that you test uh, and DOC to the directive based on harmonized standards. And if the standards change, you still wish to keep selling that product, you have to reassess your product and we'll cover that in number three of this webinar series. With the FCC, as I said before, the grandfathered certification approach exists whereby you test a product, you certify it and then that's it, it's certified forever. For Canada, you're testing and certifying to an issue version of a standard. It must be the standard that was present at the time of certification, but then you must, the manufacturer must keep up with changes to those standards, similar to the EU approach. So if new standards get published, the manufacturer must reassess their product to the new version of the standard. It doesn't invalidate their certification and they don't need to go and do a class two permissive change, for example. Their certification remains valid, but they are expected to reassess to the latest version of the standard. And if the test cases have changed, they're expected to retest. It may not be triggered and it may not even be noticed by the manufacturer in some cases and until maybe you go back to Canada to uh, report a new model number or to, to do a permissive change and that's when you get asked to provide your evidence that you've been keeping up with the change in standards. So a retest is not always necessary but um, a, an evaluation at least um, or a consideration must be performed. Again, as with the FCC, always ensure you're selling an authorised device. Just because your product is authorised and it has the uh, FCC ID and IC number on it, you know your own manufacturing quality, uh, you know your own tolerances, always make sure you're selling a product which would comply if it was called in for surveillance testing. The Canadian certification body must test 5% of the products we certify, just as with the FCC and we must report our findings to ICED Canada and the manufacturer must be aware of this requirement. So let's end then. We've covered a lot today. I'm sure I've exceeded one hour, um, but let's quickly look at some common mistakes. Consistency of information. As a certification body, I see applications where um, the technical data sheet of the transmitter says it can be one power. The user manual says it's capable of something else and then the test report says something else completely. The manufacturer has to take responsibility for this and know exactly what your product's power is capable of. If you don't, your product will get slowed up by the certification body, not because we like to cause trouble, but because everything has to be consistent and we need to know what's happening. Similarly, the operation and the, the modes of your product, everything needs to be consistent. The understanding of your product, matching what you told the test lab, matching what you submit to the application uh, in the certification body. Not understanding the basics. You know, people come along to me and they'll say, um, I think uh, my product is, I don't know if my product is an electronic device and therefore SDOC, or if it's a transmitter and therefore certification, which is it? Well, you've listened to this webinar now, so you know that it's probably both. It could be an SDOC for its electronics and a certification for its transmitter because multiple authorizations could apply. Or asking, uh, I make this change to my product, will it be a class one or class two permissive change? That kind of question proves that people don't understand the permissive change process. Not testing, um, making changes or having 10 models um, and uh, only testing one of them and hoping that uh, the other nine will be okay uh, and sitting around a room and guessing, uh, well, I bet you this one will be the worst case because it's got eight buttons instead of six or something like that. 
lack of communication. The manufacturer needs to communicate with their uh, test lab about exactly what the product does. Most manufacturers really just want to throw their product at a test lab and say, call me up when you've got the certificate. Uh, and that would be a nice way for a manufacturer to have it. But in reality, it doesn't work like that because products are becoming more and more complicated. In the old days of simple products, that, that was maybe possible. But nowadays, the test lab needs to know exactly how the product works, exactly what you're expecting it to do, your rated power. The TCB and the certification body needs to know exactly if the test results match your expectation. If you want the test report, to go from the test lab to the TCB, the manufacturer needs to be aware that they got to check it in the meantime to check that the results from the test lab really do represent their product because once it's certified, it'll be fixed. Uh, wrong company, wrong role. Uh, this is a, often a case, as I've just mentioned really, where the manufacturer just wants the test lab to take care of everything and the Test lab and TCB are so keen to help and provide good customer service that they say, yep, we'll do it. So you say I've installed a radio module into my product. What testing must I do? Well, the answer is there's no definitive list and it's the manufacturer's decisions. But often the test lab will say, don't worry, I'll, I know what to do. Well, both companies are getting it wrong there. The manufacturer needs to take responsibility for their testing and their certification. And the test lab needs to remember that their job is to test exactly what they're told to test. Thinking it's too simple, you know, people come along to me and say, I've, I've got a product, it does these five or six different things. I've installed, um, I've installed LTE, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, and RFID. Um, please test it and send me the certificate. Well, these products are quite complicated things now, and uh, this is multiple transmitters maybe operating together. The RF exposure and the emissions requirements, um, they're all simple, but uh, they're not that straightforward. They, they need some consideration and involvement by all parties. And misinformation, you can go on the internet um, and find somebody say things like, um, I'll tell you if it's a class one or class two permissive change before you've tested or install a certified module and you don't have to do anything. These things are all wrong. OK, so I've mentioned modular approvals a couple of times. We're not going to cover that today. That's in our next webinar. We're going to talk about modular approvals and installing radio modules. And that webinar is coming up next week. Um, in general, if you have a radio equipment which you have certified, and then you install it inside some other equipment, then the certification of the radio is lost because you've installed it inside some other thing. In the USA and Canada, though, there is a, such a thing as a modular approval, which would give the radio some sort of superpower, which enables it to keep its certification even when it's installed inside another product. So um, in that such a case, the FCC ID and ICED number relates to the module and not the radio. But we'll cover that in next week's webinar. OK, so any questions? Um, I hope there are some questions. I will stop sharing my slides now. I'm going to quickly put this up so that you can see the webinar series we've got coming up ahead of us. FCC and ICED today radio modules next week. Then we've got a couple of weeks break until the radio equipment directive and the UK radio regulations on the 8th of July, and then the red uh, and UK radio modules uh, a week later. OK, thank you very much. I was Michael Darby and I'm going to go and uh, get reconnect with Laura and check through your questions. Thank you. Hi, Laura. Oh, hi, Michael. Thanks so much um, for that. We've, ha we've actually had a few questions submitted by our attendees. So um, if you're OK to go ahead and, and go through some of those, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Uh, I'm, I can see them, so I'm happy to read them myself. Um, I, hope, I can see everyone's still on, so that's good. Most people are still on, so that's a good thing. OK, uh, just a few questions then. I'll read them on my other screen. That's why I'm not looking at you. Um, OK, so if you've got a product, I've got a, a massive machine, a, a, a manufacturer, a big machine, um, which I cannot take or test in a test lab. 
is it uh, possible to test it in location? Yeah, and the standards uh, do allow for what's called in situ testing. So if you had a big machine, you could take it along, say it's in a factory or um, you know any, any building really, um, but be careful that the, um, the approval, SDOC for example, um, would be for the product and the location. So you would test your machine in its location and you would decide that your SDOC is valid based on you testing it in situ in that location. But if you wanted to sell another one to a different location, you'd have to go and test that one uh, for your SDOC of that one. If you do in situ testing for equipment in a vehicle, perhaps, like if you have a radio um, and you don't want to just test it on a bench, you want to test it in a vehicle, you could test it and certify it, for example, uh, if it's a transmitter for in a vehicle, um, in that vehicle. Or if you wanted it to be into a range of vehicles, you could test it in a typical smallest, largest, and medium size one. Uh, and that's all uh, documented in the, in the ANSI test stand. Okay, next one, um, product safety. Um, so again, uh, it was a question about a machine um, uh, for the USA. Now, so product safety is not covered by the FCC, and I don't wanna to spend too much time on it i'm actually not a product safety specialist but it's one of those things where you do not need product safety testing in order to meet your fcc requirements fcc is the legal regulatory process however you probably won't sell your product if you haven't got safety testing uh, the way it works in the usa is based on the manufacturer having confidence that the product will sell uh, will be safe excuse me um, and it's all about uh, litigation and lawsuits and um, uh, you know having the insurance in place um, and so in reality you would get safety testing such as from an NRTL one of the safety test labs um, and that is how you would demonstrate it and you'd be unlikely to be able to use your product um, in the USA or be unlikely anyone would buy your product or you'd have the confidence to sell your product without safety um testing um however it's not part of the fcc's requirements or i said canada um there's a, a couple of questions which came in very early on and i hope i answered um and it was about the thing of well so is my product a unintentional radiator or is it an intentional radiator um somebody referenced my example of a washing machine is that an unintentional radiator or is it an intentional radiator and the same with my laptop well, the answer is both so my laptop is an unintentional radiator and an intentional radiator now in europe years ago we used to have this expression called primary function where we would say what is the primary function of this thing what what is it um, and we don't use that term anymore because it, it it's a bit confusing people forget that there are other things so let's say for example let's say you did say your laptop was a an un unintentional radiator and then you'd forget it's got transmitters in so let's say you say it's just an intentional radiator then you forget that it does other stuff it's got a screen and connects to printers so the reality is it's it's all of those things um and so for a bluetooth washing machine for example you would um not need to authorize it the digital device part because it's an appliance that's exempt i meant to mention by the way on uh, devices that are exempt from authorization like washing machines uh, you know appliances stuff like that they're, they're still in the scope of the fcc because they're, they're electrical electronic products but they don't need authorization so legally they don't need to be tested however there is a clause 15.5 of the fcc rules um, contains some pretty legal text which really means don't sell a rubbish product um, and it basically means if your product causes interference they can take it off the market and that's why a lot of appliance manufacturers even though they do not authorize their products they probably would test it just to make sure so uh, hopefully that's answered the question that if it's got a radio in it and it does other stuff which pretty much everything that's got radio in also does other things then it's going to have unintentional 
uh, modes, unintentional radiator modes and intentional radiator modes, and they are all necessary to be assessed for the final compliance of that product. Um, somebody's asked the question, does a pre-certified RF module uh, included in the assembly simplify any of the FCC requirements? Yes, it does. Um, we'll go over this in great detail next week, uh, but in general, certification is like registering a product with the FCC in Canada, giving them all the technical details of it, um, doing all of the tests, you know, three channels, all the modulation modes, all um, frequency hopping of Bluetooth, things like that. So if you make a product and you design Bluetooth into it, you're going to have to do all those tests and you're going to have to certify your product registering the, the transmitter with the FCC in Canada. If you buy in a certified module and you install it, you're responsible that your end product does pass all those tests. But you might say, right, some of these tests, like transmitter spurious emissions and output power, I need to check because I don't know what I've done when I've installed that module. Other things, you think, well, I haven't changed how it hops. I haven't changed the Bluetooth SIG operations. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. I, I'm going to get hold of the Bluetooth test report from the module manufacturer and I'm going to rely on that. Or maybe I'm not. I mean, it's on the FCC website. You don't even have to have it. Um, and I don't need to register it because it's already been registered by the module manufacturer. Um, so it's not just to install it and forget it. You, you have to do some tests and you have to state contains and reference the FCC ID of the module. Um, but um, but you, do, uh, you do get to avoid the certification. The only danger, of course, is if you're using a pre-certified module, if you want to change anything, you have to go and work with the module manufacturer because they own the certification of the module. Um, if we have a, um, oh yeah, if we have a certified RF module, is it necessary to do an SDOC or certification for the host system as well? Yes. Oh, as I was speaking, I got to the end and I thought I've used the wrong term there. It's supplier's declaration of conformity, not self. When it first came out, it was called self declaration of conformity and I got that into my head. It, it's supplier's declaration of conformity. Hopefully that doesn't change anyone's life. Um, so, yes, if you've got a product, if it didn't have a module in it, it would have some SDOC or certification. If you put the module in, you still need to have the, the transmitter is certified, so hopefully you don't need to certify the transmitter part. But the host product, if it does other things, which probably it does, it would need its own SDOC or certification. Um, so, for example, if you certify the host, maybe because it's got another transmitter in it, or maybe you haven't got a USA-based rep, so you want to do your certification, and you've put somebody else's module in, your label might say FCC ID for your certification number, and then also contains FCC ID for the module. So, yeah, you do need to authorise your host in addition to the authorization of the module. Um, one more question has just come in. How do we determine which standards need to be applied? Is there a definitive source of information? Yes, there is. Um, I didn't put a link to it on the slides, but um, it, basically when you read through the FCC rules, I say when you read through as if anyone's ever going to sit and read through the FCC rules, but there are sections early on in the FCC rules which state here are the standards which must be followed. However, there is conveniently a page on the FCC website where they say, here is a definitive list of all of the standards we will accept and only these ones. Um, so if, for example, ANSI C63.4 for spurious emissions of electronics, ANSI C63.10 for all tests on unlicensed transmitters, ANSI C63.26 for licensed transmitters. It's not like Europe where you're going to have potentially hundreds of Etsy standards and you've got to thumb through and find the one that applies to you. There are really only a few um, applicable standards. Uh, and, you know, ANSI C63.10, that's a good example because the 2013 version is listed on the FCC website. There's a 2020 version out now, it's published, perfectly good standard, but don't use it because it's not listed on the uh, FCC website. If you're developing a product, 
that you think you might be ready for test and certification in two years from now, then feel free to go and use the 2020 version as part of your R&D and development. But for test and certification now, use the one that's on the FCC website. And if the FCC have published a KDB, these are these test procedure documents, you can use any of those. And they, they take a higher priority than the ANSI standard. So for example, um, the ANSI C63.10 for unlicensed transmitters, they have a clause in there for things like Wi-Fi uh, and Zigbee and stuff that says you measure the power peak or average and it lists some power meter settings for average for or, and for peak one of them channel power with a peak detector the fcc doesn't like so the fcc have got a kdb out that says use that standard but do not use that method um, and the kdb takes priority over the standard so the test lab should know all that okay um i think that might be it um are all manufacturers inside and outside the USA considered assemblers? So an assembler is a company with, sorry, Laura, uh, a company within the US uh, FCC terms, an assembler is somebody who takes component parts, puts them together and does an SDOC on them. That's what an assembler is. A manufacturer, I guess, if you're doing an SDOC, when you've bought in a screen and a power supply or whatever, then you kind of are. But um, if you're, manufacturing a product and certifying it then you're definitely a manufacturer a bit of a gray area of what the difference is there i guess all right uh thank you laura i think i really am finished now uh yeah i don't see any other questions oh thanks 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 so much for that mike and then, oh, sorry, uh, I, ran on. I literally i would i would have loved to have spent 10 minutes on each slide um and i could easily fill one or two days with this topic but um nice. here we are no, it's great to yeah, it's great to hear everything. So yeah, thank thank you so much for going through that and going through all the questions as well, Michael. Um, as as you as you mentioned earlier, there will be actually another webinar at the same time next week on on the seventeenth of June. That's actually going to be on modular modular approvals and installing radio modules. So if you go over to our event page on element.com, you'll find um, links there so that you can that you can register. So um, if you are interested, please um, please go ahead and, and register for the next one. Um, same time next week and um, so finally we will also um, be having a short survey that's going to appear on your screens um, any moment it's only literally five questions so if you if you can take the time to answer those questions um, we do appreciate your feedback so we can help us improve our future webinars but um, thanks thanks Michael and thanks again everybody for attending and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Okay. Thanks very much.